Good afternoon and welcome back to Buggy One. This is Polar Bears International. I'm Elisa McCall. We are sitting on Tundra Buggy One on the shores of Hudson Bay, just outside of Churchill, Manitoba. And we do have two polar bears right under Buggy One right now. If you have been watching our polar bear cams People today, to we've had some beautiful footage. Oh, there they are. You guys can see them. They're right outside. So we have Katie Miller, one of our staff members on Buggy One here. She's outside getting some snaps of those bears. These two have been hanging around together for the last few days. We got to watch them yesterday afternoon. Uh, they were chewing, they were doing some really nice sharing of what looks like a goose wing. So not gonna give polar bears very much energy, but something to chew on. Uh, they spent this morning kind of lying together, doing some sparring, which is like play fighting. And now they are kind of going down this line of buggies, saying hello to everybody. And it's our turn right when we've started this live chat. So it's so much fun. Uh, one of the bears has some distinct scarring on its nose and the other one doesn't have quite as much. We aren't 100% sure if we can call them males or females yet. Uh, people were wondering yesterday if it's maybe a mom and a large adult cub. You know, it's really hard to say they're quite affectionate with each other. Our best guess right now after watching them is that right, it's two younger males uh, just banding together. We're calling them trouble buddies, <laughs> getting into stuff out here. But we can't say for sure um, until we have a little more evidence. Oh, he's biting our tires. Those polar bears, they're so funny. So <laughs> thank you for joining us today uh, and watching the bears with us. It's a great way to have polar bear week with all of you. So it is Polar Bear Week out here on the tundra. Of course, we celebrate polar bears all fall, but the first week of November is our favorite time of year to talk about the polar bears even a little bit more. So we have live events all week, social media, and we'll be highlighting our Detect and Protect project, which I'll come to in just a minute. Uh, the theme of today's live chat is the future for polar bears. And we'll talk for up to an hour, but we might log off a little sooner if there's uh, no questions. If you do have questions, please do let us know. Pop them in the chat. Uh, we, I'm checking them and I have people helping me check the chat uh, either on explore.org or on Facebook. Uh, we'll try to get to your question as soon as we can. But before I go any further, I'd love to introduce my special guest panelist today. Dr. Flavio Lehner is our new PBI Chief Climate Scientist, Polar Bears International's Chief Climate Scientist. We're so happy to have Flavio here. Flavio, can you tell everyone a little bit about what you do and who you are? Yeah, uh, welcome everyone and thanks Lisa and uh, Polar Bears International for having me. Uh, I'm PBI's new uh, climate scientist. I'm actually a climate scientist in my sort of day job as well. So I study how the climate changes uh, using observations of the real world, uh, computer models, all kinds of pieces of information to learn how the climate is changing right now and what the future of the climate might look like, uh, both globally as well as in particular regions, and we can get into that later, like out here in Hudson Bay. So some of you may know that PBI's uh, chief scientist is Dr. Stephen Amstrup. Uh, Dr. Amstrup is retiring this year, and so we have hired two people to try to fill the shoes of Stephen. Flavio is one of them. We couldn't be more happy to have him aboard with us. Fabulous climate scientist, great communicator. And we also have uh, Dr. John Whiteman, who's joined us as our chief research scientist, and all of you will be meeting John at some point, I have no doubt. Uh, so Polar Bears International is just so thrilled to have fabulous scientists on board, helping us understand the world and guiding where we need to go for improved polar bear conservation in the long term. Uh, so first, I want to talk a little bit about our Detect and Protect project that I mentioned, just because this is kind of what we're focusing on for Polar Bear Week. Uh, what we're asking people to do is, is check it out. We've got a lot of online um, information about it. Ultimately, the goal of Detect and Protect is to further human polar bear coexistence in the Arctic. Polar bears are spending more time on land, which we'll talk about. And the longer that polar bears spend on land, of course, the hungrier they get. Those bears, they want to be out on the sea ice eating seals. That's how polar bears survive long term. They use sea ice as a platform on which to sneak up on unsuspecting seals. And then they eat the seal blubber as their main food source. They simply don't have that on land here. And they are adapted to spend times on land living off their own body fat. But we are pushing that period longer on which they have to fast and rely on their own body weight. And these bears, they lose up to a kilogram of body fat, body weight a day when they're out here on the tundra. So when we're pushing these boundaries and making these bears spend longer periods on land, 
they're getting hungrier, they're more likely to follow their noses, to fill their tummies, and that doesn't always work out great for polar bears or people. It's our goal to keep both species separate and safe in a warming Arctic, and that's gonna involve a lot of kind of creative and proactive approaches, a lot of safety tools, everything from low tech, like garbage bins, proper garbage bins, um, and messaging, to kind of higher tech stuff, like a radar project. Um, so maybe some of you have heard about our Bairdar. It is a very interesting program. Uh, BJ Kirschhofer, who many of you know and who's running the show today, uh, he's just behind the camera there. BJ uh, has helped kick off this radar project and the idea is that we're training radar to understand and look at what a polar bear is. So if we can teach radar what a polar bear looks like, then we can set a radar system up in a community or at a camp, at a garbage dump, and it can be scanning the surroundings for polar bears. Then it can give people early warning, and that early warning cannot be underestimated for how helpful it is. So here's an example, this camera here that you're seeing, these movements that you're seeing, uh, it's driving itself. It's picked up on a polar bear, it's zooming in on it, and it's letting us know, oh, I see a polar bear outside. So we're refining the system where we have several different types that we're using right now. We're testing it out here on the Tundra. Churchill is one of the best, if not the best, place in the world to tech test technology like this because we know where and when the bears will be here. So it's very like predictable. We will see polar bears, so it's the best place to test this radar system. And hopefully in the future, it will help us give communities more warning and get inside, get more safe, um, get more prepared for a polar bear. The more prepared you are, the more likely you are to stay safe and then also keep that animal in the wild and deter that bear instead of having to come to more lethal options. So check out more about Detect and Protect. I'll, I'll post some links. We've got some cool uh, videos online. And we also, I think, I just, we've got a really cool video. I think now is a nice time to show you before we kind of get into more climate stuff and talk about what the future looks like for polar bears. And I'll have Flavio talk a little bit more about his work. Uh, but BJ's got a really cool video keyed up that I'd love to show you right now. Great, so there you get a good idea of what we're celebrating this Polar Bear Week, so check it out. Uh, and again, please let us know if you have any questions. It is so much fun to watch these polar bears outside right now. <laughs> I think they've walked down walked down the trail, so we'll, uh, we'll keep our eye out for them. And there's other bears out here too, and actually, before I forget, uh, one polar bear that some of you might have seen yesterday or the day before is a mom with a cub out here. The cub is a young cub, so we call it a cub of the year, or koi for short. And this mom does have a collar on her. And I understand that sometimes seeing a polar bear or a wild animal with a collar can be a little jarring, um, but this mom is in great condition. The collar looks perfectly um, well adjusted for her neck and it's not, you know, it's not bugging her at all. And we have so many decades of tracking data and we've also looked at whether these collars impact polar bears or not. And we can say that the collar does not negatively <coughs> impact the bears as long as it's adjusted properly. And the amount of information that we can get from polar bears with these collars is incredible. And we would not know what we know about polar bears without this technology, without knowing where and when they go on the ice and how they're using their habitat. It's so, so important for us to know these things. And these are the type of data that will tell us. And a really exciting piece of this story is that every year Polar Bears International has and follows collared female polar bears on our bear tracker online. And anyone in the public can go on the bear tracker at any time and see where all these different polar bears across Hudson Bay are. It's really neat. And we have some bears that are sponsored by our partners and we just kind of use that to write stories and as kind of an outreach piece. And this year I had got the list of the polar bears that are collared. We're getting our bear tracker ready for the next season. 
And I chose the polar bear to be followed by explore.org, which we've done in the past. And when we found out who this polar bear is, I looked it up and it's the explore.org polar bear uh, that I will be writing stories about for the explore.org community. So it's so neat to see her out here. She's 10 years old. Um, she had a litter a few years ago and clearly has a healthy cub now. They saw them back in the spring. They still look good. Uh, we're excited to kind of know who she is. Her number is X33570, so every polar bear gets a unique ID number, and you'll be learning more about her throughout the year. We'll, we'll follow her all year long. So it's really neat to see her in person come into this area, and hopefully we'll, we'll see her again. So if, you, if you've got questions about that, let me know. I think there might be a naming contest for her for fun for the Explore community. Uh, if, you, if you see her on camera and you're inspired with the name, uh, hang on to that and maybe submit that to the naming contest. Okay, so that's a lot of fun stuff, but I should probably get back to the actual core of the live chat today, which is we're talking about the future for polar bears. So I wanted to start off with just some cool facts about polar bears, because we really believe that to help us protect and conserve a species, that starts with love. That starts with appreciating an animal. That's a huge part of why we love explore.org. We have these live cams that help us bring this incredible wildlife to you wherever you live and help you build that relationship. And fun facts always kind of help too because you know polar bears are pretty special. Some of my favorite facts about polar bears. They're the biggest bear, the biggest bear species of all eight bear species. They are the only marine bear. So of course, every other bear, brown bears, panda bears, those are terrestrial bears that live on land. The polar bear lives on top of the ocean. That is pretty cool. Polar bears rely on Arctic sea ice and the marine environment. It's a bear that needs the ocean. Very, very neat. Polar bears are among, if not the, world's most traveled four-legged animals. So they're most mobile of all animals with four legs. What that means, is if you think about like a tiger or wolves or elephants, they have, you know, they move a lot, they have migratory patterns. Polar bears have some of the largest home ranges ever recorded. In some areas of their range, they have home ranges up to 600,000 square kilometers. That's like bigger than the province of Manitoba, bigger than California. Crazy, one bear can travel that much in some areas. Some areas do have smaller home ranges, but it depends where the bears are in the Arctic. I think that's pretty cool. Um, another super cool fact that we just learned last week is that of all the bear species, polar bears have the largest brain to body ratio. So their brain is so big compared to their body, and that probably helps them stay extra smart. And if you imagine having to hunt seals out in this landscape that looks like the moon and it's moving under your feet and it's cold and you're trying to find a prey species that lives underneath the water i can't i'm blown away all the time by how difficult the polar bear's life is and they have to be so smart and so curious to figure out that landscape and find food and you see that curiosity and that intelligence come out here when you're watching them on camera so truly polar bear week is such a great time to celebrate polar bears we want to keep them in the arctic we have to keep them in the arctic we need to protect the species together they're worth protecting and you know what's cool everything we do for polar bears we do for us too so let's talk a bit of what, about what's going on with polar bears you hear us talk about polar bears might be at risk um you know climate warming what what is actually going on and that's why we're so lucky we have flavio here with us flavio maybe you can kind of start big and then we'll get down Big picture, polar bears need Arctic sea ice. What is going on with Arctic sea ice? Why are we losing Arctic sea ice? Yeah, um, sort of the high level uh, story is indeed that the ice is simply melting because we are warming the climate, we're warming the planet. So uh, the sea ice out here uh, on the ocean, as well as ice on land and glaciers, it's all melting just like an ice cream melts on a hot summer day because temperatures are rising. Um, so that's a straightforward story, which makes it actually um, relatively easy to understand why polar bears are so threatened by uh, a warming climate. Um, so we uh, collect data in the real world to sort of get a better sense of how fast this is happening. And maybe we can talk a little bit later about what we've learned in that regard, uh, because mm -hmm. it's a constantly evolving topic and I'm doing research on that to better know those numbers. But the big picture is really that the ice is sort of receding rapidly because we're warming our climate. Absolutely, and for polar bears and for any animal, if you start decreasing their habitat, they have decreased access to food, fewer calories are consumed, it's harder to get your body as big or have as many babies when you're not eating as much food. And that's really what it's coming down to. And these bears here, 
These bears are in the western Hudson Bay population, one of 19 around the Arctic. Different areas of the Arctic kind of have different rates of sea ice loss, and Flavio can get more into that. But here we have seen losses in sea ice in the last 40 years, and these polar bears are spending three to four weeks longer on land than they used to. And, and Flavio, that's projected to continue, correct, the loss of sea ice in Hudson Bay? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, in all regions in the Arctic and sort of Arctic-wide, we expect uh, to see continued sea ice loss uh, simply because uh, we expect global temperatures to continue to rise. Um, global temperatures are closely tied to how much greenhouse gases we emit. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, currently we are still emitting greenhouse gases. We can talk a little bit more about if that is going to change in the future. But currently we're emitting a lot of greenhouse gases, so temperatures have to go up. Uh, that's in a way simple physics uh, that, that guides this. Uh, and so we definitely expect temperatures to go up, uh, sea ice to go down uh, in the next couple of decades, both in individual regions as well as Arctic wide. Right, and that's why we talk about polar bears and polar bear conservation, and that's why we're pushing for global climate action now and real action, not just mouthpiece stuff, but real changes that will move us away from burning fossil fuels as our main source of energy and move toward using renewables on a large scale. Wind and solar energy from nature is what we need to do, both for the polar bears and the Arctic sea ice, but for people too. And you know, Arctic sea ice truly is the Earth's air conditioner. So no matter where you live or where you're viewing us today, Arctic sea ice does impact your life somehow. It is so cool, cold and white and reflective. It reflects sunlight away from the Earth and it helps cool our entire planet. It also forms the base of the Arctic food chain. So creature, little um, plants like algae grow actually inside sea ice because of the, the channels that are formed by the salt. And those little plants are you know, it's like the plants in the soil in a forest, and they feed the entire food chain all the way up to the polar bear and to the people that share the Arctic. This marine ecosystem is so critical to the bears and the people in the north, and we need to make sure it is preserved. I do have a quick question, and then we'll keep rolling on. So back to the GPS caller. It's a great question. Will it fall off by itself, or does the bear have to be darted? The GPS collars are programmed to fall off by themselves. In fact, they have two mechanisms to release. So there's one that we program on a computer, and then when we hit that certain day, which is a year, um, sometimes a little bit more after collaring, it will automatically fall off the neck. And if somehow that fails, then the way that the collar, um, like the screws on the collar are purposely designed to degrade, particularly in seawater. So they break down and the collar will break down and fall off. Um, I knew from seeing this bear the other day that th she was recently collared. You can tell because her collar still looks nice and, and white and clean. Usually by the time the collar falls off, you know, the bears have spent a whole you know, year hunting mm -hmm. on the ice. But then in this area, they've been on land for a few months. Uh, usually the collars will fall off about September. So the bears would have been on land June, July, August and like rolling in the dirt and all that. Yeah. <laughs> and when we retrieve collars before, so we do try to retrieve collars. If we know where they landed, we'll go get them because we can refurbish them and it saves us a lot of money because they're very expensive. <laughs> um, but if we can get them back, it's great, but they're usually so stinky. Like they really smell like dirty polar bear and then also some other animals like to chew on them. So we found a collar once that had clearly been chewed on by like foxes maybe or it, anyway, it was just full of animal teeth marks all over. It must be a really interesting object to wild animals when it just drops in the middle of like Wapas National Park. So anyway, fun facts about polar bear collars. Um, in other programs we'll have and then we have had, we will talk more about different tracking options. And if people have more questions, I'm happy to talk about that today. But we are, uh, we are using also ear tag GPS and working on a new burr on fur system where we can just simply put a tracker in the fur and it will fall off naturally when the polar bear molts. And we think it's important to have different options. So different types of tracking for different situations and different types of data. Uh, we think that that's very important. Here's a picture. That's the size of one of those GPS ear tags. So just that that's my hand there. So just a small white tag. Uh, you can see how small that is. And then this is an example of that on a fur tag. And you can see we've got this neat mesh. You pull the fur through. The tracker sits on the back of the bear. And then it just falls off in the spring when the bear is molting its hair. So a lot of cool options happening. At the end of the day, tracking data is some of the most important data we can collect for polar bear conservation knowing when and where the bears move, why, and seeing how they respond to changes in sea ice. Uh, it tells us so much, particularly 
about females, moms with cubs, tells us so much about what's going on with those moms and cubs as those ice patterns are changing. If you can imagine your little cub, you have two years with mom, just over two years for mom to teach you how to navigate the ice, and now the ice is changing so fast. And so those bears, again, they're so smart, but there's a lot of change going on, so how are they adjusting to this changing world? It's really critical for us to know that. Uh, Flavia, I want to come back to you and talk a bit more um, about the future. So we've had a lot of great chats out here. Again, we're very lucky to have fabulous scientists working with us. We have kind of talked about, like, where do you think um, we should go with, like, polar bear research in terms of your perspective as a climate scientist? Like, what is next or what should we be doing as polar bear people uh, knowing what's happening in the climate? Yeah, that's a good question. And so, so that's uh, also... I think why it's exciting for me to work with Polar yeah. Bears International <laughs> to try to bring climate science uh, to basically where climate change is happening and having impacts to try to figure out uh, where, where can we make a difference. Um, and I think when it comes to uh, all these changes we see in environments like the decline in sea ice, I think what we want to try to figure out is like which regions are threatened the most, right? Uh, there's, different, there's 19 different uh, polar bear uh, subpopulations. Uh, and in a sense, they're all threatened by climate change because uh, as long as we keep warming, sea ice will disappear. But they're in very different places. And so certain regions see a much faster sea ice decline than others. Uh, and so we want to probably better understand why that happens in certain regions, uh, why the sea ice is decreasing uh, faster, and whether that actually means that those populations are the most threatened. So when we develop conservation efforts, we want to make sure they're tailored to the latest data in terms of where is the sea ice declining the fastest? Where we, do we expect the first problems to appear? Uh, and in general, I mean, this is maybe a bit expanding on that. Uh, like my business, so to say, is to try to predict the future. And uh, you've all, if you've ever tried to do that, that's not easy. <laughs> um, be it like a weather forecast or, uh, I don't know, a stock market uh, prediction. Uh, luckily, we can rely a lot on physics, which is, is quite helpful. But still, it is a projection into the future. And so we don't know perfectly uh, what's going to happen. And so we do a lot of work trying to understand uh, what are the remaining uncertainties uh, and so, like what are the remaining questions when it comes to the future and try to answer them ahead of time so that we can prepare uh, in various ways, conservation efforts, but also adaptation uh, of, of communities to climate change. Pretty cool stuff. Very important stuff. Projections are hard, but it's so important. We have kind of these, yeah, ideas of where we're going, and then we know what to do about it. And Flavio's mentioned a few times about, you know, we know what's happening. We know this relationship with greenhouse gases and warming. That's great. That's great that we know what's happening. When we know why something's happening, we can fix it. We know how to fix it. And we really, again, need to move away from burning these fossil fuels and move toward more renewables. And part of doing that is that it needs to be at a global scale. And next week, the COP27 meeting happens, and that's in Egypt this year. We do, at Polar Bears International, we have a staff member going, and we're also supporting six members of the global community to go. That includes climate educators, indigenous representatives, voices from the north, people that you know need to have some input here. And the goals that we have at this conference transcend borders. This isn't about, oh, this country versus this country. This is humanity altogether, and these are all our collective species that we care about on planet Earth. So we need to show up and put pressure on politicians. We need to balance those government voices with frontline people that are experiencing impacts of climate change now, and we need to put some pressure out there for adaptation, mitigation, actual better commitments, sticking to old commitments, furthering financial commitments, uh, we need to actually get some a better playbook in place and, and make sure that happens. And we are very optimistic. There's some really great things happening there. Um, there's a lot of good coordination happening. And we will be there. Uh, we're going live next week, COP27. We'll have someone there. If you have any questions, we'll be covering the event and we'll be sharing what we learned there. Uh, us and our delegation with you. So we're really excited to be able to do that this year. So stay tuned for more about COP27. And if you have questions, please let us know. Uh, Flavio, again, as a climate scientist, I'm kind of curious how you feel about COP27. Um, are you excited? Have these been effective? Can, can we actually see climate change come out of this sort of meeting? Yeah, this is an excellent question because as sort of the name says, COP27, it is sort of the 27th of those right? uh, <laughs> it's conferences. Been it's been a while. They happen every year. 
I still think this is a great tool. It is a global problem that we're trying to solve here. So the global community has to come together. And that's usually what happens at these conferences. Um, uh, but it's been a slow progress, right? 27 years of these meetings where countries come together and talk about uh, what the best way forward is to tackle the climate problem, including all the usual politics when, mm -hmm. when, when politicians and countries talk yeah. to each other. Um, so I'm like both hopeful and I'm uh, like optimistic that this will continue to be the way we try to solve this globally. But as you said, it is super important that uh, people from outside, sort of from the general public, from nonprofit organizations, go there, contribute, sort of observe, uh, and put pressure uh, on the process to make sure that we accelerate the transition to renewable energy and a, like a fossil fuel free way of living uh, because the longer we wait as we talked about earlier the the more warming we'll see the more negative impacts we'll see on uh, polar bear sea ice and all kinds of other ecosystem and actually at the end of the day also humans uh, we especially 2022 so far we've seen uh, a whole number of very extreme events around the planet uh, that affected humans directly uh, and so that's basically what we're in for if we don't tackle the climate change problem exactly the decisions that our government officials make today have a true impact on the future for polar bears and ourselves. So we do think it's important um, that we're involved in COP27 and we look forward to the outcomes. While we talk about you know action, I did want to share some good news stories. So we know the polar bear's future is at risk. If we were to do nothing at all, we would see warming that could threaten the majority, would threaten the majority of polar bear populations around the world with reproductive decline. We know we don't have to be on that trajectory. We can change it. And there's a lot of fabulous things already happening to change that future and get us to a future with a cold, intact Arctic and polar bears roaming all around. So I'm going to share just a couple cool stories that have been in the news. There's plenty more. Uh, just, you know, Google good climate news stories sometimes if you're feeling um, hopeless. That's what I do sometimes when it's like, oh, my goodness. There's so much hope out there. There's so many good things happening. Uh, we have especially the youth contingent of the world. They are on it. You know, this is their future. There's really, really cool stories right now already going on. Um, I'm going to give a couple examples. So already nearly 400 school districts right now across the United States are receiving about a billion dollars in grants to purchase about 2,500 clean school buses. So this is something we talk a lot, moving over to more electric vehicles. In fact, the Tundra buggies right now, there's a couple electric Tundra buggies out here. Super cool, Frontiers North Adventures has committed to changing over their Tundra buggies to be electric by 2030, and they're doing a couple at a time. It's really neat, they're so quiet and smooth, and we can't wait till buggy one is electric too. Watch out for that on the horizon. Very exciting on a global scale, electric vehicles, very big deal. Another great, great story is that the International Energy Agency has found that there are now more people employed in clean energy than in the fossil fuel industry. That's a big deal because, we, you know, we used to hear that more about jobs and jobs is a big thing. Of course, people, you know, need to work. We need to make money and have jobs created for the economy. Absolutely. How exciting is it that now the clean energy sector is growing so fast that there's so many people employed? And I know the demand is rising. We're going to need more um, electrical engineers, more people that can install solar and handle um, and help us transition over to these different types of energy. But we can do it. And that industry is booming. And that is so exciting. There's a lot of great investments in there. Another uh, very, very cool story is that there are now 100 universities in the UK that have pledged to move away from non-renewables. So this is 65% of the UK's um, higher education sector. And this commitment means a 17.6 billion pound loss for the fossil fuel corporations. And this was led by student campaigns. So students put so much pressure on their universities that these universities have made a big shift. And that is just the power of voices coming together, communities coming together uh, to work on what we want to see. And at Polar Bears International, that's one of the biggest things we tell people they can do. If you don't know what to do today for polar bears, talk about it. 
Talk about how you feel. Talk about what you love about the bears. Talk about what you love about your own environment. Maybe you have a fishing hole you go to or a forest you used to walk through or still do. There's nature all around us and it's important that we protect our resources for our future. And by talking to people, by sharing how we feel, we're shifting the societal discourse. We're shifting how people think about it and what's okay to say. Research shows that most people don't want to talk about climate change, not because they don't believe it. Most people believe climate change, they understand climate change, but they're self-silencing because they assume they are in the minority. In fact, we're in the majority. We know what's going on and we need to use our voices together for that change. And another way we can use our voices is through voting. And we can vote for leaders who will make these changes for polar bears, for people, big, big things we can do. And then just looking at these community level uh, programs that are going on, like the electrical school buses or like, you know, wind power in your community. Maybe check out what type of energies are around you. Uh, we kind of encourage students these days if they're looking for a student project. Well, why don't you look up who your elected officials are, see if they're doing anything for climate change, write an email either in support of what they're doing or asking them to do more. There's a lot of ways our officials are, you know, they represent us. They should be representing what we need and want to see in our world. So there's a lot of ways we can get involved. Um, if you have any more questions, please do pop them in here. I have a couple more. Um, and then Flavia might throw you one more question just about like kind of what's next for you at Polar Bears International. And otherwise we'll, we'll hang out. We're still looking for polar bears. So we had a question the other day. And this is kind of cool because BJ and I have been talking about it on the buggy quite a bit. Are there chips that can potentially be used on bears instead of collars? Is the technology available? So we, right now, we have tried chips in the past on bears. So I'm thinking when you say chips, I'm thinking like an RFID tag or something very small that maybe can just be like put under the skin uh, and it can tell us who this bear is or where it's going. Right now the GPS units have to be a certain size with the battery to talk to the satellites. And in the past the tags, the RFID tags that were put in the polar bear skin, they were lost. When the researchers caught those bears again, they couldn't find them. We think the bodies either ejected it or because polar bears, they have such a thick layer of body fat that tags like that can just kind of like float around a lot more easy than in animals that just have a thick layer of skin. But we are getting to the point uh, where we think technology might be in a place where we do have some options. Um, so we are looking at the idea of maybe embedding RFID tags and something or, or maybe trying to use those in the future. There's enough going on out here now that I think we might be able to get there at some point. So no promises, but we'll see how that evolves. It's been really cool being well, working with polar bears for over 10 years, working with BJ for the last decade. Things have evolved so much. When I started working with polar bears in 2010, you know, the genetic side of polar bears was pretty new. Only a couple people were doing that. And now it has exploded and there's so much genetic work being done. We're learning the pedigree of these bears out here, which bears are moving where and mating with whom and what kind of genetics we need to make sure we're keeping in the population. Like that has just exploded and the technology we're using has improved so much. Collars are already smaller than they used to be. Tracking is already more efficient, better data. There's a lot of cool things happening. So no doubt in the future we'll take, you know, give us another 10 years and we'll be learning even so much more actually so a question for you that I had what's like you have to use a lot of technology being a climate scientist like I assume you're using satellites or what kind of cool technology do you use as a climate scientist to understand what's going on with arctic sea ice or other things that you're working on yeah I mean especially when it comes to uh, sea ice satellites mm -hmm. are tremendously important and uh, we only have really good satellites that um, record things happening around our planet since the sort of like late 1970s, early 1980s. And so in a place like the Arctic, that is really hard to get to. I mean, it took us a long time to even just get to Churchill, Manitoba, where mm -hmm. we're now at the, the shore of Hudson Bay, mm -hmm. to get further into the Arctic and like um, observe sea ice there. Uh, satellites are really, really powerful. Um, and so especially when it comes to Arctic, uh, we are kind of limited in the sense that we only have really good data since the 1980s. Um, but uh, it's now a long enough record that, yeah, as we talked about, you can kind of see this very stark decline in sea ice. So satellites are super important uh, to observe our own planet. And then when, when it comes to um, looking into the future, 
Uh, we are relying on computer models that try to replicate our Earth and uh, what we call simulate. So it, you can think of it as like a, a digital twin of our planet that we have in a computer uh, that we then try and use to make predictions. It's a little bit like how weather forecasts are being made, but instead of just looking at seven to ten days, we try to look out uh, over the next century. And for that, we use like uh, super powerful computers. They're actually called supercomputers. Um, <laughs> Because now these models of our planet are so complex that so many equations to solve that we really need a big computer, uh, your iPhone wouldn't do, um, to solve that problem and make these, these projections. And so, uh, yeah, I end up spending a lot of time on the computer, but at the end of the day, I always try to make uh, a couple of nice uh, yeah, pictures and graphs because I, yeah, I'm a visual person. Uh, but yeah, lots of technology that goes into, into understanding our planet. That's, I like that you said that at the end because one of the ways Flavio came to us was that you were helping Steve Amstrup, our current chief scientist, you were helping him create visuals because Steve also knew the power of amazing visuals to represent climate science and when he was looking for someone to help him show what he was talking about, he was directed to you. And Flavio was so great to work with and did such a fabulous job uh, that Steve kind of got his hooks in him and never let him go. And now we finally got to hire Flavio. So yeah, we agree, visual is amazing. That's part of at Polar Bears International why we love showing you the polar bears. Visually seeing something can be a lot more impactful than just hearing numbers and hearing ideas. So I want to show you, I think BJ has it queued up, we have a very cool, very visual uh, short video of some of the amazing research that our team is doing um, in Svalbard, Norway. It's just really cool to see some of the work we're doing. So I think that's pretty cool. You can see that there's a lot of fun things about polar bear research, working boots on the ground, finding polar bear data, uh, bringing polar bears to you. Those polar bears are just outside the buggy right now. They're so funny that they're hanging out together like that. Uh, we have a lot of reasons to have a lot of hope for polar bears and a lot of that is because of the amazing people we work with, the amazing people we're surrounded by, um, the adults, the youth, everyone who really you know cares about this animal. So, Flavia, what, you know, what have we actually done? Like, what have we accomplished in terms of, you know, hoping, securing the future for polar bears? Yeah, it's a good question, and uh, I think it relates to the, these uh, climate negotiations that we talked mm -hmm. about before. Um, so, from a climate science perspective, what we try to do when we look into the future, we look at so-called scenarios. You can think of it as, like, uh, what-if stories, right? Uh, if we keep emitting greenhouse gases at the current rate, how is the planet going to warm? Uh, if we do something about it, how does that future look like? And obviously that information is then used to predict uh, how threatened polar bears are, etc. And so if we look back now, uh, 10 years, uh, when we made projections uh, for the future, uh, we had a range of possible outcomes, like worst case, uh, yeah, lots of, uh, I think the numbers were maybe 70 or 80% of polar bears were, would, would have been threatened by the end of the century. And then best case scenarios where they, they have a good chance of surviving. And if we look back now 10 years, we've actually uh, started to make quite a bit of progress in terms of renewable energy. Uh, you might see in your neighborhood uh, solar panels on roofs, uh, maybe 
um, wind power plants coming up. And so we've actually made more progress in that sense than we expected 10 years ago. As we mentioned earlier, it's not fast enough to avoid some uh, future warming and some future negative impacts from that. But uh, looking back 10 years, we're actually making progress. And this is in no small part because people vote for politicians that then help make renewables uh, more affordable for everybody so they can go up on your roof and elsewhere. And so this is like a direct success of people voting, taking part uh, in, in democracy and putting pressure uh, on the system to change. And in, in some ways, we've actually been able to sort of rule out the worst case future scenarios that we thought would going to happen 10 years ago. At the same time, we're not making progress fast enough. So the best case scenario is also currently not looking like it's going to play out. So that shows you that we have work to do, but that our work is actually starting to have an impact. So we just have to accelerate that, continue to keep the pressure up uh, to really secure the future of polar bears and all other ecosystems. Thanks, Flavio. So well said. Those bears outside are just so nice to watch. So <laughs> I will kind of start wrapping up here and we'll get back to some beautiful bear viewing. Um, but we did have a question. How can someone get involved with Polar Bears International? You know, right now, the best way to get involved is by, you know, looking at our resources and sharing them around. Uh, that helps us so much more than you know, just to spread the word about what we're doing. And Polar Bears International and Polar Bears, if you're interested in visiting Churchill, uh, there's a couple options. You know, we come out with Frontiers North Adventures. They lend us Buggy One, give us the, the lease that we need to use Buggy One, and all these spots on Buggy One at the lodge every night out here. So they do that for us all fall. Going out on a tundra buggy to view the bears is pretty cool. If you're looking for a job up here, there is a booming tourism industry. There's lots of jobs to be had in Churchill. If you're looking for volunteering, uh, I would suggest checking out the Churchill Northern Study Center. So that is a wonderful, wonderful research facility up here near Churchill. They often need volunteers to help them. They've got people cycling through the center all year round. You're in the middle of the tundra and you get to see some pretty cool stuff. So again, the best thing any of us can do is just keep, keep talking about it, stay plugged in. We're going to keep talking about it. I'm talking all the time about polar bears. Uh, please continue to join us for Polar Bear Week. We have more things going on tomorrow. We've got a webcast tomorrow about decision-making mamas. It's about moms and cubs mostly. We have social media. We've got all sorts of great things. And then next week, we also have a webcast with Discovery Education. And we're doing a live event, again, from COP27 with our wonderful staff member, Emily Ringer, who will be over there. And in the meantime, we'll just keep watching these incredible polar bears and trying to answer any of your questions. So thank you so much to explore.org. What an incredible partner. Thank you to all the viewers. Thank you for your time today, for your questions. Thank you to Flavio. So fabulous to have you here now and in the future. We will have Flavio around if anyone has climate questions and he will be here for years to come, I have no doubt. And we will see you all soon. We'll get back to the polar bears. Thanks, everybody.